pleasure to be back here with you again, Father Ignatius, to discuss your book, The Virtue of Mercy and Forgiveness. And in this discussion, we're going to focus on pages 125 through 142. Uh, this is really great. This gets into some really practical things here. I think we can all relate to. Uh, and to start us off, uh, Dr. Robert Enright describes six stages regarding forgiveness on page 126. So why is it helpful to think of forgiveness in terms of stages? Sure. Thank you, um, Remy. Well, first, I just want to state the six stages for you one more time. Um, so stage one is revengeful forgiveness. Um, stage two, restitutional or compensational forgiveness. Stage three, expectational forgiveness. Stage four, lawful expectational forgiveness. Stage five, forgiveness and social harmony. And stage six, forgiveness as love. And what Inright is trying to do is he's trying to create a developmental, moral um, philosophy, understanding of forgiveness. And just like there's a developmental model when it comes to how we develop as human beings, you know, the different stages where it's like zero to, to one and then one to three and then four to six, et cetera. Um, there's different ways as we develop, you know, we have a greater understanding, we have a deeper understanding, we have a more complex understanding. And, and he believes there's a developmental model for forgiveness. So maybe someone does, has learned very little about forgiveness during their life and they come across his work, they start to learn about forgiveness. They start at this lowest level and they start to work their way up. Mm -hmm. And eventually you get to forgiveness as love, you know, forgiveness as um, giving this gift of love, compassion, mercy um, to another person. That's kind of the highest level, if you will. And yeah. uh, we start at these lower levels um, where revengeful forgiveness, the first stage where we're really only willing to forgive if the person goes to jail first, you know, right, for, right. for instance, or is person's punished. Um, while that is forgiveness, uh, developmentally, it's, it's the lowest level. And so I think it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's definitely a way to, to look at it um, that can help us um, understand it. And, and for ourselves, hopefully we're, we're growing and developing in our own understanding of forgiveness, mm -hmm. um, which is making it a, easier to get to this forgiveness as love um, more quickly and more completely. Yeah, this is really helpful. I think everyone can look at each one of these and say, oh yeah, I think I did that once, <laughs> once or twice. And, and it also is good to see what you're working towards too, that there is a place, a goal <laughs> for forgiveness, not just because <laughs> you have to, or, you know. Yeah. And I think some of it is even, it's not always that you get beyond these. It's that you work through each of these mm. um, six to get to number six. You know, your first reaction is I'm not forgiving them unless somebody catches them, you know, and unless somebody punishes them. Right. Um, that might be our first reaction. And, but if we can recognize, well, while that's not necessarily wrong, it's a pretty low level of, forgiving. Um, right. Maybe I can go on to the to some of these other stages. I can't remember if he goes into this, but um, on the different stages, is, are you, is the result kind of different internally for you? So if you do forgive as love, as opposed to revengeful forgiveness, I mean, wouldn't the after effect be different, if that makes sense? Sure. I think, I think the the different stages, um, there's motivations for doing it. There's desired outcomes when you're doing a given stage. Um, and, and so as you get closer to forgiveness is love, um, there's more, more is happening. There's a more positive result. Um, so I think, yeah, in the lower stages, there's a more limited result. Um, it's not like there's no good that's happening, but, mm -hmm. but you're, you're limiting the good because you're you're saying um, 
you know, I can only forgive if I receive back what's taken from me. Mm-hmm. Well, okay, if, if that actually happens, then you can forgive. And if you if it doesn't happen, then you're stuck. You know, you're not going to forgive. So. Well, I'm kind of going back to our theological section. I mean, when you are, you know, in stage six forgiveness as love and you are, you know, acting more in a divine manner, you know, as God forgives, you know, so you're getting closer to him, I would imagine, as well, working in that stage. Sure. Yeah, I think so. Um, And in a sense, God helps you through these stages. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we moved from uh, stages to phases. Uh, (laughs) Dr. Enright also describes forgiveness as a four phase process on pages 127 through 129. So how is this different than his stage approach? Sure. Well, the stage approach is a little different because there are three, four state, four Four phases. Let me try that again. So the phase <laughs> approach is a little different than the stage approach right. because there are four phases, and in each of these phases, there's units. Mm-hmm. And all together, there's 20 units. Um, so there's kind of these mini steps within each phase. And for instance, like phase one has eight units, and um, phase two has um, three units, and phase three um, has a number of units as well. And I actually really recommend going back to the actual work of of Enright. Um, Forgiveness Therapy is a book. And he goes through in detail um, all 20 units. I just try to pick out one for each phase um, because it's too much to try to go through them all in my book. Um, but it is it is interesting um, to look at them all. And <clears throat> so phase one is the uncovering phase. Stage Phase two is the decision phase. Um, phase three is the work phase. And phase four is the deepening phase. Mm-hmm. And it's just another model. It's another way of looking at it. Um, it's It's not so much about moral development as it is kind of the natural stages that we go through. You know, we have to undercover, um, uncover what's happened. Um, we don't always completely understand what's happened or why it's happened. Right. And so that's phase one. And then once we understand what's happened, we, we make a decision. And, you know, some people make a decision not to forgive once they understand what's happened. Wow. Um, but hopefully, you know, we can make that decision to forgive and that that decision to forgive involves work. You know, it involves um, going through a process to get to this deeper level of forgiveness. And, and then once we've actually done that um, forgiving, there's things that happen afterwards. So the deepening phase and he would also say, um, this might take you a year to do this. Right. Um, especially with something more serious or more extreme. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. It's, it's, it's worth it. Um, one of the studies that we looked at, you know, later it's a, it was a 14th month, 14th month study, you know, and even after 14 months, I'm sure for most of the people in that, that study, um, there was still more, you know. Oh, sure. Um, yeah. Well, if nothing else, it's helpful to just know and understand that there are phases and steps and stages in all of this. You know, I I think a lot of us don't even realize that or didn't know that. Um, I mean, I think it's interesting, this uncovering phase. I mean, sometimes you don't even realize, like you said, you don't even know what happened. You know, it takes time to just kind of understand what the injustice was or or how to you know understand what happened to you um and then you know getting to that place where you're deciding 
what you're going to do about it once you understand it. But even understanding a situation may take a long time, especially if something happened to you as a child, I would imagine, you know. Sure. And even and even in that sense, you could go through these phases more than once. Oh, sure. Um, you know, and as you remember more or as you understand more. As you, yeah. yeah, it's really helpful. Well, um, we haven't left the moral virtue, the virtues. <laughs> it's all tied together. Can you say a bit more about uh, Dr. Enright's definition of moral virtue on page 131? Yeah, at the bottom of 131, and this is coming directly from forgiveness therapy, he says that moral virtue has these eight um, characteristics. Um, one, it's, it's goodness. Um, two, it's an inclination to what is good. Three, it's understanding what you are doing. Um, four, it's something you put into practice. Five, it's not necessarily perfect in expression. Um, six, it's demonstrated in different degrees by different people. Seven, something that avoids extremes. And eight, someone who is consistent. So generally speaking, the moral virtue of forgiveness is something that's very good, good to do, good to practice. It, it leads to good things in your life and often in the life of the other person. And that virtue is in, inclining you, drawing you to something that's good. And in order to, to, do, to practice the moral virtue of forgiveness, you have to understand what forgiveness is and what you're actually choosing. And once you do that, you can put it into practice. There are tangible things you can do to forgive. Um, you're not going to do it perfectly, and that's really not the goal. The goal is more to just do it as best you can and do it, you know, um, with a good intentions and, and just, you know, putting forth your best effort, which is never going to be perfect. And for some some, it's going to look different in different people. And generally, the moral virtue of forgiveness avoids extremes. Um, one extreme is to not forgive at all or to not worry about it or not think about it. Um, another extreme is, is to forgive and put yourself in a harmful situation again. Right. You know, th both of those are extremes. Um, forgiveness is, is the moral virtue is in the middle usually. And if you have that moral virtue of forgiveness, then you're consistent in, in, in doing, doing this um, at different times in your life with different mm -hmm. people and different situations. And so I think he actually gives a really good definition of moral virtue. It's a little different than maybe Thomas Aquinas's. It's a little more psychological in some ways, um, but it's, it's very helpful and, and, um, helps us understand kind of the whole picture of what moral virtue can be and, and is um, as we practice it on a deep level. Yeah, and I love how, you know, realistic it is, right? I mean, it, it points out that it's not necessarily perfect in expression and it's uh, different degrees by different people and, you know, when you want to avoid extremes. But it's just, it seems to me like a real realistic, I mean, all of these lists and phases and stages they're, they're very realistic like dealing with the whole person and you know there isn't some sort of unattainable place that we're expected to to go to with this and I think that's why forgiveness is so difficult for people many times because they think it's kind of this especially if it's a real hard situation like it's just something that they're never gonna be able to do I think you have an example in here where somebody told him like I'm not a good person for your study because I'm just never going to forget. <laughs> and he said, no, you're a perfect person. <laughs> right. Because he, he wanted to see whether it could really work, you know, whether yeah. for, for someone in an extreme situation. I mean, these were people that had experienced incest as children. And mm -hmm. yeah, most of most, a lot of them thought they would never forgive, never, could never imagine that until they, started to work through this the stages and the phases and understand moral virtue and 
it is interesting in here, like even um, a number of these that that it's goodness, that it's an inclination to what is good, um, that it's something that avoids extremes and it's someone who is consistent. Mm -hmm. um, all of that fits pretty closely with um, St. Thomas Aquinas' understanding of, mm -hmm. of virtue. And he always, you know, he believes virtue is usually moderation between two extremes, for, for example. Yeah, yeah, an inclination to do what is good. That reminds me, I think it was one of your homilies recently where you, if you don't want to, you don't have the desire to forgive, like you can, you know, ask God for the desire to forgive. And then if you don't have the desire, what did you say? The desire to desire? <laughs> yeah, the desire to desire. Give me the desire to desire. <laughs> yeah, just keep moving far, further and further yeah. away from it. Until you, just try, you're still heading in that direction. Um, but <laughs> Yeah. Well, uh, you laugh, but it works. Yeah. Like once you start praying for the desire to desire, then then you get the desire and and then you know it goes on from there. So. Yeah, that's great. That's really helpful. Um so Dr. Enright and you mentioned also Dr. Fitzgibbons, um they have a list for insight regarding forgiveness. Well, one of them is that there's not a need to focus on intention and that seems kind of counterintuitive and most of us think that intention really does seem to matter. So why do they advise this? A lot of times you're forgiving and you're not going to, I mean, sometimes you're forgiving and you're not going to have this direct, I forgive you conversation. You know, when that's going to happen, there's more um, a desire for reconciliation. And, and so intention does matter a little bit more in that situation. And, them admitting that they did something wrong matters if you're going to reconcile. But when it comes to forgiving someone that there's no way you you may not even, even see them again, or it would be dangerous to try to see them, or they've already died, or they, you don't even know where they live anymore. Right. Those kind of things. Um, their intent. One, you know, you don't know their intention. Mm -hmm. So you can you can guess their intention, or you can think you know. But you really it's always a dangerous road to go down. <laughs> and sometimes, sometimes they really didn't know what they were doing. Right. They didn't understand how it was going to affect you, but it still hurts you very deeply. Right. So if you focus on intention, it just gets confusing mm -hmm. pretty quickly. But you know what how it affected you, and you know how it hurts you, and whether they sometimes you're forgiving them for not thinking about how it would hurt you. Right. You know? um, and, and so if you can put intention to the side and just focus on how it affected you in a negative way, then it, it's pretty clear what you're going to forgive them for. Um, when you put intention in there, it gets, so you're talking about like their intention. Yeah. Their okay. Intention. Okay. Yeah. Like, did they mean to do this? Did they try right. to do this? And I think um, we can get really caught. Like I said, that's a dangerous road to go down if you start trying to figure out what they meant, you know, because then you're getting really stuck in this bad headspace, I think, you know, um, and it's just kind of, it's just not a good place to even go exactly. to. Exactly. And that's one of the things where you can't stop thinking about it, you know. Become did more they, attached to it. Yeah, and... and <laughs> You can stay in that place for a long, long time. Oh, you can yeah. stay there for years. So if you just let go of worrying about intention and focus on how it affected you, even even things like with parents, sometimes if if parents if a parent never told us that they that they loved us, for instance, or mm -hmm. they didn't do it very often, or you know, that's something you could forgive them for. I forgive my mom or my dad for not telling me that they loved me. Um, but if you focus on intention, well, right. you don't really know their intention right. or why they did that. And, and, and it's, it's not even about, it's about something they didn't do. Right. And sometimes yeah. you have to forgive for things people didn't do. And that that's not really about intention. It's 
it's more about neglect and just mm -hmm. not thinking of the other person. Yeah, I think you said something important too when you said um, focus on the things you do know. You know, <laughs> like okay, maybe I don't know why they did what they did, but I know how it affected me. So let me start there. Yeah, that's a good way to say it. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so now we are moving to the section of peer review forgiveness studies. So how is forgiveness therapy different than other kind of therapies? Right. So obviously there's a variety of therapies out there. There's probably 20 or more these mm -hmm. days, lots of different therapies. And some of them do seem to focus more on your symptoms, um, what, what's coming up because of what happened instead of dealing with what happened. Um, and that might be a place to start sometimes, but it, it's not really gonna get to the heart of the matter. So mm -hmm. a lot of times you deal with the symptoms for a while, maybe they get a little better for a while, but then, then it comes back because the source, the source hasn't been tanker. dealt with. Yeah. And other kinds of therapy, it's more, you know, what are you feeling? What are you thinking? How, does, how is it affecting you? What can you do to change how you're thinking, how you're behaving? And again, that's not bad. You know, it can help the situation some. Um, but forgiveness therapy actually looks at what you're experiencing, but also what the other person did mm. and says, no, what the other person did was wrong. A lot of times in therapy, there is no right or wrong. You know? It's more, what can you learn from it? Oh, you know, okay. Like it's, it's, there's no feeling is right or wrong. There's just kind of this, it's a little bit vague sometimes. Yeah. But forgiveness therapy sees no, the goal is to forgive. That's where we're going. Like, right. That's our goal here. We want to get to a place where you can forgive. It might take a while, but that's, that's the goal. And we're going to admit like in the beginning that the other person really did something horrible to you. Mm. And we're not going to discount that or act like that didn't happen and that, that that has had an effect on you. And now we're going to try to learn more about forgiveness and then go through the, the stages. And there's kind of a, it starts with a kind of a forgiveness education, if you will, because most of us don't understand forgiveness that well. Right. And then, and then it, going through the stages and the phases um, with the goal of getting to an ending place. And, and so it's much more intentional. It's much more direct. It's much more clear what the goal is. Um, and some therapies aren't, aren't always that way. Yeah. I imagine that's so helpful to have that acknowledgement, like, okay, something did happen that wasn't good. Let's now, you know, take care of this or get, you know, figure out what to do and go through those stages. Um, just having that acknowledgement and being able to solve it or at least start the process, you know, and going right to the source. Um, because there's not only, I think, you know, what happened, but then who were you? What, what did you bring into that situation? You know, that you have to kind of deal with it on many different levels, but it sounds like you get <laughs> to more of a solution, <laughs> you know, with forgiveness therapy. And he talks about, uh, how a church or a, par a parish can actually become a forgiving community. That sounds really nice. What might that look like at St. John Vianney Parish? <laughs> yes. So obviously I'm the pastor here at St. John Vianney Parish. And I have been loosely doing this. You know, I preach a lot on forgiveness and mercy and healing, both here at the parish and at the chapel. Um, I wrote a book on it. <laughs> I'm going to do the parish mission this year on it. Yeah. And all of that is, is really, really good. I think though, there is a need for me to put forward more, a more specific plan for the parish for, for 2023. And mm -hmm. I hope to do that. Um, that would include things like myself and father Glenn, um, preaching on forgiveness um, at different times during the year, um, including focusing on on the sacrament of confession and reconciliation and 
how important that is for mm -hmm. for Catholics, and and then there's a variety of other things we can do as well. Whether it's putting things in the bulletin, putting things up on on the you know our walls up here on some of our boards, where we can um, display different things regarding forgiveness. Um, whether it's showing a video or a movie that's where, where forgiveness is a big part of that. Yeah. Um, and I I plan to to develop that you know more more have a more in, intentional plan in the future and because I want this to be a a forgiving community um, a reconciling community a mm -hmm. community that values that and we're gonna have to do that anyway right like yeah. that's gonna come up um, I'm gonna make mistakes other parishioners are gonna make mistakes and. I would hope we can get to a place where when I make a mistake, um, somebody could tell me, for instance, and mm -hmm. know that I would respond well to that and vice versa. You know, when somebody else makes a mistake that I could be able to tell them and they would they would respond and that there would be um, a sense in which we can forgive each other and reconcile and um, keep keep going forward, hopefully. and all of that's important and something that I value and something I want to keep working on in our parish. Yeah, we already got a head start with you as our pastor and focusing on forgiveness so much. And yeah, it seems like the first step is creating that environment where, you know, people feel uncomfortable going to you and each other, you know, and just keeping very transparent and, you know, and then things don't kind of build <laughs> right, right. right. I think you already answered my last question here, you know, with the specifically how can we become a forgiving community and how might we continue to grow? You already gave us a lot of <laughs> a lot of ways to do that. Sure. And obviously this is part of that as well. Yeah. I mean, it it does start with forgiveness education. Mm -hmm. Um it's hard to grow until we have a common understanding of of what it what it looks like and then and you start to practice it and you encourage it and you um create an environment yeah where it's encouraged and and where people just know if i if i ask for forgiveness i'm going to be forgiven if i let someone know that i was really hurt um they're going to ask for forgiveness mm -hmm. and and then then it builds from there so yeah. Yeah. That's great. I mean, who knew about forgiveness education? I didn't know about that until, <laughs> until your book. I think it's something that many people don't even know exists. They don't know that there's, like you said, they don't even understand what forgiveness is exactly. So this is really helpful. Thank you so much, Father Ignatius. Can you finish us off with a prayer? I can. Um, we will finish with <clears throat> the prayers from the divine mercy. Um, and so we pray in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Mm -hmm. Eternal Father, I offer you the body and blood, soul and divinity of your dearly beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, in atonement, atonement for, for our sins, sins and those of the whole world. world, for the sake of his sorrowful passion. Have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion. Have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion. Have mercy on us and on the whole world. Holy God, holy, holy mighty, mighty one, holy immortal one, have mercy on us and on the whole world. Let us pray. Eternal God, in whom mercy is endless, and the treasury of compassion inexhaustible, Look kindly upon us and increase your mercy in us, that in difficult moments we may not despair, nor become despondent, but with great confidence submit ourselves to your holy will, which is love and mercy itself. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.